What happened to Peace, peace. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, it's kind of uh, choppy a little bit. Is your Wi-Fi on? Uh, let me check. Hold on, all right? All right. Yep, we good to go. <laughs> all right, that was it. Hey, thank you so much for yeah. meeting me uh, today. It's been a, a pleasure watching you from day one till now. This is a history lesson, episode number 103. I'm with the legendary Slim Kid of the Far Side. Thank you again for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. That's what's up. No doubt. I want to jump into it. I don't want to waste any time. So if you could take me back a little bit uh, to where you were born and raised. Oh, man. Born and raised in Los Angeles, uh, South Central Los Angeles, California. That's what's up? <laughs> yeah. Uh, can you take me back to uh, maybe a day in the life of Slim Kid uh, growing up as a teenager in uh, Los Angeles? Oh, man. Well, you know, growing up in uh, South Central is kind of on, on my block. It was it was uh, it was all good, all love. Uh, it was definitely it's definitely the hood. So. You know, you go through all the the hood type stuff. You know what I mean. You're um, not trying to be negative at all, but you know, like the drive-bys and you know when you play football in the street, tackle on the sideline type deal, and cars come through. You don't know right. who's who. You know, you gotta. Um, it was just it was just the hood, or just you know going to school. You know, you gotta take um, you know two or three buses that go through different um, different gangster sets, and you gotta know where you at. You know, the writing's on the wall. But other than that, man, I, I love Los Angeles. Los Angeles was a beautiful place to, to grow up. Uh, I learned a lot, a lot of um, a lot of good homies, hustlers, you know, teaching you how to, you know, be men or teaching you how to do the right thing and, and, and not get caught up in, in, in certain things, you know. So it's, it's I ain't trying to draw no negative whatsoever on the city at all because L.A. is, man, is such a beautiful place to have been raised. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, luckily, I was out there right before COVID hit, and I had the time of my life. So um, uh, can you yeah. take me back to uh, some of your earlier influences before you got into hip-hop? What was Slim Kid seeing uh, in L.A. coming up, and uh, who were some of your earlier influences? Man, that's a great one. So, you know, I went to I went to Inglewood High School and um I was like kind of one of those kids that, you know, I was like a little skater and I was a breaker. You know what I mean? So me and my homeboy uh Monty Crumble used to be in my uh driveway with a, you know, just like a cardboard, just cardboard all over the driveway so we can do our, you know, head spins and just practicing our breaking moves and stuff like that. You know what I mean? So <laughs> that was my influences were like a lot of the old school tech, technic, technicolor kind of deal, you know. Um, oh man, the song R9 or Dr. Dre back in the day, uh, Rodney O, Joe Cooley. Egyptian um, Lover, maybe? Egyptian Lover, yes, exactly. I just want to get you in that, in that space. <laughs> and, then, and then here comes BDP, mm. KRS One. Here comes LL Cool J. Here comes, uh, you know, oh my goodness, um, shh, homie, just rest in peace right now, uh, friends. D -d 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 yeah, ecstasy. Houdini. Yes. Yeah, Houdini. You know, I was listening to that type of stuff. Um, Fat Boys, Run DMC. You know, they, these are uh, the influences that kind of carved who I am as an MC. You know what I mean? Like, if it wasn't for KRS One and LL Cool J, you know, they probably wouldn't be no Slum Kid. I, I'd be doing something else. Right. But um, hip hop was such a beautiful thing to happen to us as a whole. You know what I mean? Like when you listening to um, um, The Furious Five, you know what I'm saying? Grandmaster Flash and stuff like that. You know, like The Message. Just that song in itself. You know, and then coupled with Parliament. Uh, yeah. <laughs> coupled with Rick James. Right. You know, you know it's, it's, that's the kind of soup that, you know, that's that gumbo that we were sipping on to make us who we were, 
you know, there's a lot of good elements in that, that, you know, you know, carved who we were, you know, as, as, as a culture, you know what I'm saying? So right. that's, that's where I was at. That's where my head was at. Gotcha. I'm in the time frame now. So you were talking yeah. about uh, breaking the, the cardboard. That was your first foray into hip hop before MCing, right? Yeah, pretty much, you know, like once again, you know, it was like a lot of the techno music um, before I was even in hip hop. It was it was definitely, you know, Tour de France and all that type of stuff to pop in and things like that, because um, that's what that's what we that's what we, it was about. You know, um, that was the outlet, you know what I'm saying? So and then, oh, my goodness, you can't when when hip hop came along, I'm I'm, I'm serious, like. The movie Flashdance, the breaking parts, you know what right. I mean, or breaking itself. That that movie, or dang, I'm, I know I'm missing something, but all the breaking movies back in the day, you know, uh, Wild Style, you wanted to get it going. You wanted your Puma sweatsuit, you know what I mean. <laughs> Absolutely. You, wanted, you wanted your fat laces. I had to be careful with my fat laces, you know what I mean. <laughs> I had the black and blue Pumas with some blue uh, blue shoes, them fat laces. You know, you can't go everywhere in L.A. with Right. <laughs> you know, everything's coded. <laughs> Absolutely. So take me back to the pieces of the far side. Who was the first member out of the group that you met and how did you meet them? Was it through dancing? And just take me back to that puzzle of meeting the first. Uh... Yeah. <clears throat> well, I, you know, I was uh, really good friends. I'm still good friends with Imani. You know what I mean? So we, we used to hang out with my boy Kai Mackey uh, and uh, Thomas Nicholas and stuff like that. And so me and me, Tom, Kai and Imani, you know, we used to, you know, run the streets together pretty much, you know. And we, I went to El Camino College and I hung out with my boy, um, uh, Stone Mecca. It's like it's it's a lot of names, you know. Um, but uh, my my homeboy um, Robert Tillis introduced me to Jay Swift, and Jay Swift was the 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 first. You know, he was the he was the producer, so he was the first thing to like really like connect us to that whole uh, movement of what we were doing. So me and Imani went to uh, SCU to link up with um with Jay Swift and Reggie Andrews and and their whole uh GTI their whole team of folks and at the time um so I think uh Jay Swift was like yo I want you to meet up with um Robert Vinson and Romy Robinson who's you know Booty Brown and they were in a group called GTI so and and these guys they was crushing Miguel Brent Robert uh Robert Vinson um Romai, Imani, they was killing it on the dance scene. So these, this is this was the big beginning of Far Side, and all we did, bro, was go out and battle other crews. That's how we made our money. That's how we ate. You know what I mean? And we would make music on the side. So once we once we finally met with uh, Romai and um, and Robert Tillis, we were able to form you know two for two at the time because that was the name of our group at the time and then a little bit later fat lip came along and he fat lip came along at, at such a crazy time because we were <laughs> such a rowdy crew you know what i mean it was, it was crazy because uh we were actually uh having like um like fat lip came over and he brought his girlfriend by and we were like you know um kind of rehearsing and stuff like that and we had beef with some other crews and these motherfuckers came to the door <laughs> and so we we was about to scrap with these this crew, and so uh, Fatlip was like, Fatlip was like, "Yo, what the hell's going on?" We was like, "Put him in the closet. Put him." We put Fatlip <laughs> and his girl up in the closet, and close the door, so we can go handle our business with this crew. And so, like, the crew was like, you know, it was it was just a crazy time, and it, it was a crazy moment for Fatlip to <laughs> jump on board, you know, with what was going on. So that is like little little part of the, uh, history about just like just you know how we came together what kind of brothers we were or whatever we was about our craft and stuff like that but there was always dance battle troubles or or girl troubles or something at the door you know that we had to fend off and so that is that's where it all started <laughs> So at what point did you guys begin to fine tune? You had you mentioned a lot of names. So how did we get down to the four members and how did the name Farside come about? 
So it took, a, it took a long time for us to get down to the four members because we were such a tight-knit crew. And I mean, as the, the SCU crew, you know what I mean? Like, um, <clears throat> if we really had it our way, we would probably have been like one big, you know, Wu-Tang Clan type of situation. Um, so what happened where, where things broke down to it just being the four of us, because Robert Vincent was like a, a very uh, strong part of our crew, um, but he decided that he just wanted to, you know, just do choreography and be a dancer full on. So he went on to dance behind Janet Jackson, like full time. You know what I mean? And like everybody, like, it was just so many, it's, there's so many parts. This is a big, right. this is a bigger story than, than what you will ever receive. You know what I mean? Right. But there's so many parts, but he wanted to do that. So he, he did that thing. Um, we became uh, far side a little closer to his de to um, Robert Vincent's departure, you know what I mean? And it was like, the reason why we became Farside in general is because there was a, we were called two for two. We were on a living color as two for two. Um, and there was a band called Front Two for Two. So we couldn't be our magic number that we wanted to be. So we had to create another name. And so we sat down and wrote like about 200 names and seeing what fit and floated and what really fit us. And one thing that we came up with about who we were is whatever we do, we're going to take it to the furthest that we can take it. Kind of like, um, I think it was Motown 25 or something when Michael Jackson got there and he just like kind of gave it everything. When you first saw the moon was bust out, you know? And it was that type right. of energy that let us know that's what the far side is and that's what the far side means to us. Whenever we take part in something we go like we take it beyond you know what i mean so that's where the right. far side um energy and everything came about pretty much uh can you log off and then log back on you're getting choppy for some reason just log yeah, right yeah, yeah. off and then I'll, I'll join you all right there we go okay appreciate everybody joining us for this history lesson i'm with the legendary Slim kid from the far side. He's going to join us at any moment. Um, got a little choppy there, but I want to get this as clear as possible for the viewers. Here we go. All right, we're back. Looks much better. Does it? Yeah. Got choppy right. for a minute. Are we good? Are we good? good? Yeah, we're good. Yeah, I'm just saying, you know, you know, you just be in one of the weird rooms in the house, you know. Yeah, no doubt it happens, but we'll we'll work it out. Um, yeah. Can you take me back to at what point you guys started uh, getting serious and uh, making a demo? Um, we were always serious, like a hundred percent. When we were at SCU, we did a lot of showcases. I mean, for every label that you can think of, we did the showcase for it because Reggie Andrews. Um, had us busy all the time, and we were always uh, in deep study of making music and how to make music, uh, music arrangements, everything, choreography, um, just performances and the whole deal. Uh, so when we, we always had like a lot of songs, so we were always prepared um, for a, a record deal, because that's, that's exactly what we were doing when we were two for two um was the time when we were we were going to be on interscope at at one point but they went with uh dr dre and and snoop and everything like that so like they during that time they only had like one act that they could kind of go with as far as i can remember um i think it was called third stone at at one point as well and you know things just went the way that they went um we were excited that you know we were excited we was like yo yeah this might be the situation and um, it didn't turn out, but in history, you look at where everything went and that was just magical for, you know, uh, Dre and, and, and everything. And so we had kind of got jaded a bit, you know, because of so many, you know, um, so many times that we had gotten, you know, kind of turned down or let down or whatever. And then we kind of start going our own way um, at that point. Um, uh, Roma, Imani, and, and Fatlib went up to the Gavin convention because we had to go everywhere to showcase whatever we were doing with the songs that we had. You know what I mean? Like, I think we, they, we had, like, Pass Me By, we, we had that. We had um, what, um, Your Mama, uh, no pun intended. 
We had officer. And, you know, we just had, we were always prepared. We had a lot of stuff ready. And so when uh, Imani, Romai, and, and Fatlip met up with um, with Razkaz, Razkaz um, had a little situation in this hotel room with, with, you know, Paul Stewart, who became our manager at the time. And Paul Stewart was the one to uh, basically reintroduce us to a lot of different labels. There was Matt Jones from... Uh, from Motown, there was folks from Def Jam. There was, I mean, everybody. We, you know, we started having lunches with these folks, and you know, um, Paul had put them up on our music, and we was ready to go. You know what I mean? So we wound up. Um, luckily, we were in, we were jaded. Luckily, we were jaded enough to um, not be so ready to jump on anything. So that said, I mean, we had we had like a lot of money on the table. But it wasn't about the money, it was about the creative control. You know what I mean? So if we were blinded by the money, when we jumped on a, a certain label, and back then it's like, you know, labels have schedules. And you jump on that label and now you get put on the shelf and you gotta wait or not even, you know, like it was just like a lot of, you know, chess chess games going on. So um we made a great decision to go with Delicious Vinyl at the time. Uh, for a lot of reasons. They had a lot of things that, you know, checked a lot of our boxes. You know, they were doing the heavy rhyme experience with all the heavy hitters on that we were able to get on that record. And Brand new heavies, that, yeah. Yo, that record, um, I thought our shit was corny. <laughs> so flower? Man, oh, I thought our shit was No, I I no, shit was no. That was like one of the standout <laughs> tracks, and I'm not just saying you that because like I'm talking weed. to you. <laughs> <laughs> Motherfuckers yeah. just like weed. Let's be real. All right? <laughs> no, but Soul Flower was cool, you know what I mean? But um, it was like as who we were trying to be and what we were trying to get at that, you know, a lot of the whole Bizarre Ride record, we were trying to be something different because of who our peers were. We had De La Soul, we had, you know, Tribe Called Quest, we had that sound that we wanted, you know what I mean? We had, man, you name it. Um, we were trying to get our stuff up to that sound, um, that sound bracket. We wanted to get our bar up. You know what I'm saying? But um, right. it didn't really happen that way. And luckily for us, um, it was our record was like a comic relief pretty much for all the stuff that may have been like hardcore, hardcore or or whatever. You know, like people were like, I couldn't believe like we were on heavy rhyme experience with all these heavy hitters and people was like, we like these guys. Right. Yo, that 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 really rocked us because, you know, like I said, we didn't think. I mean, Soul Flower's cool. Right. But they, you know, the East Coast loved Soul Flower. They loved your mama and stuff like that. And it was like, man, like DC, like, was the one that, like, really pushed the song Your Mama, like, heavy. You know, shout out to all the DC crew out there. You know what I mean? Like, it was, I don't know, man. The universe just really uh, walked us in and walked us through. Like, we were. It, it, I feel like sometimes it wasn't even us. You know, all we had to do was kind of be us energetically and what we needed to be on stage because we was like, ah, you couldn't fuck with us on stage, B. That was just a wrap. Please don't let us go before you because we was going to murder that show and then the crowd just leave. And there was right. plenty of shows like that. It was crazy. And we didn't mean it. It's just who we were. It's just what it was. You know what I mean? Because we were so, I think because we were, what we learned from SCU and how we were at SCU and how GTI was, you know, dance wise and just our, just our whole being, what we did, you know, that energy, everything about it. We, in, in short, we we're very grateful. Very, yeah. very grateful. You know what I'm saying? I talked to Amani uh, later last year, and he was telling me that everybody wanted you guys except Def Jam, and they ended up going with Onyx. Do you remember that story? I don't remember it that way. You know what, man? You got four different brothers. You gonna have four <laughs> different stories. I, I noticed that. that I thought right. Def Jam was on point with us, man. I thought they were, you know, man, Def Jam was putting money up too. You know what I mean? Right. Like, let's not get it. Look. We are in our mind when they were like bringing another label up to us, like, yo, you know, blah, 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 wants to meet with you. They want to take you out to dinner. We was like, dinner? 
Let's go have some more dinner. We didn't give a fuck about who it was. We didn't give a fuck about nothing because we were so used to getting turned down and shit all the time. You know what I mean? It's like dinner. Hell yeah. You know, somebody who else gonna pay for dinner? Let's go. You know, right. and that's all we was doing is pretty much. But as we did that, like I said, we were able to make good sound decisions on, you know, creative control is one of them things you need to be right. you. You know what I mean? It's just, man, could you imagine, like, we would be so different if we were on another label, bro. You know what I'm saying? Like, we would have lost, you wouldn't have seen, I don't know what far side would have been if we were on some other label. Just, you know, like, Delicious gave us so much creative freedom. You know, we had our we had our ups and downs, and we had our arguments, and we had some times where the motherfuckers didn't understand, but I, I tell you this, man, it's just the formula that was necessary to bake this type of cake that came out that everyone enjoyed for life. Like that, the artwork with Slick and Dan, and, and it's just all the parts were perfect. It's like, it's like living on planet Earth. All the parts were perfect for humans to be, to have existence here. Right. Everything was perfect. It was perfect to happen. Passing Me By was like such a great song on its own. Like if you listen, like we were like, kind of like letting the music like kind of blare in the background and you would just get hairs like just stood up on you, you know, like Jay Swift and them, they, they, did, they, they did the damn job. You know, and then when we, you know, came up with the, you know, she keeps on passing me by and then Fat Love went in there and sang the chorus and then I went in there and did the harmony part and the shit wrote itself. I'm just glad to be on board. You know what I mean? Right. And I like to yeah. keep that. I like to say this like this, bro, because I don't, I don't want to get arrogant about shit when it comes to what Far Side is and what and what it was. You know what I'm saying? Because this was a goddamn blessing. I am happy to be on board what this is this movement this energy and how we feel about it bro we about that music just like q-tip is about that music just like you know what i'm saying like our peers are like De La is about that music be real is about that music and keeping bands together you know i know our band's not together right now but we have brothers and, and you know we look at them as brothers and cousins in this in this industry like the be reals and the De La's that be you know they pull you to the side and they talk to you, you know what I mean? This is a this is a family. This is a musical family, bro. And it's like, yo, I'm I'm just, you know what it is. And, and we no keep doubt. the bar we keep the bar high. You know what I'm saying? With people, you just can't come in here. Right. You come in here like like music to me, and to be in the music business is like kind of walking into a room with all white carpet, and you got your muddy shoes on. <laughs> right. Fuck out of here with that shit. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. <laughs> Fuck out of here, man. Uh, so, we haven't mentioned know, one name yet, and that's L.A.J. How did he... Uh... Oh, yo, I'll get to that. Yeah, I'll give me time. <laughs> all right, all right. Yo, it's a slow LAJ process. Is, is, L.A.J. is 100 for me, man. L.A.J., that's the, that's the brother of all brothers, man. He was... I learned so much from him. From him. He was definitely, and still is, my production partner. You know what I mean? Like, that bro is precise. Right. He looking for a right. snare, he looking for a motherfucking snare, the right one. You chopping you know up I mean? again. You chopping up again. Can you log off and join me again? Yep, we'll do. Let's All right. It. All right. It's getting good, y'all. Appreciate everybody joining me today for episode 103. Shout out to everybody around the world. And we are back. All righty. Is that good? Yes, sir. Just has its moments from time to time. Yeah. Uh, it's as it's slow. Life. It's not choppy <laughs> like it was. We're good. It's all good. All right, let me. We're getting a good chunk, so that's all that matters. So, go ahead. Man, I could just pull up another location. <laughs> let me see. Yeah, I'm gonna walk with okay. you. All right. All right, that works. All right, here we go.
Ah, fresh air. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> What's the weather like in L.A.? All right, you got me. Yeah, I got you. Yeah, you got me. <laughs> okay. All right, let's go, man. You good. Yeah, I'm good. I'm okay, good. you com you you comfortable? I don't want you to uh, have to oh, I'm hold. Just, I'm, I'm real good now. You good? Yeah. Okay. Good. All right, you was you were you were speaking on L A J. Yeah, L A J. Man, like he's um, he's thorough. You know what I'm saying? He's super thorough with everything, mm -hmm. man. He. He's like one of the one of the best producers I've ever met or worked with because and it's good that I worked with him side by side because I could see how you know how meticulous he was about things and that is extremely helpful when it comes to what it is that we do musically. You know what I mean? Right. So yeah, that's that's um and even to this day, like you know, like coming up with um I think we did uh other fish. We had other fish, and then he came up with other fish part two, which is uh, double life. I don't know if you've seen that on on uh, YouTube or anything with uh, right. Austin Antoine. Yeah, but yeah, man, that's that business. L A J is the one. He, uh, him, and um, Jay Swift always work really tightly together. They worked with um, Bell Biv DeVoe. I worked with them with with them also when when they were doing that project because we were always in the same rooms all the time, working on music and building music. You know what I'm saying? So right. L.A.J. always kept it 100. And now my homie K. Nat that works with us too from the, with the Bizarre Ride team, you know, we all, I can't wait to put new music on people, man. <laughs> no doubt. We're going to talk about that in a bit. Yeah. Um, can you take me back to being so young? What was your thought process going into your first debut album, uh, Bizarre Ride to the Far Side? Oh, being so, man. Um, first off, just being happy to have a record deal was was one thing. Um, I think it was a lot of uh, a lot of fun, just fun energy. A lot of um, we were still focused and we were still like kind of you know going out and and still dancing on the dance scene because that just kept us, you know, our minds in a good space of what type of music that we would be making. You know what I mean? But um, very excited and happy uh, and the music reflected that you know right. because if you if you go into the second record you can hear that we were jaded we got jaded a little bit and these like there will never be we could never make another bizarre ride to the far side album in a type of mind state that lab cab in california had right we can possibly make another bizarre ride today because there's you have to shed off so much of what you've learned or know or and all these things because we were blank canvases you know and um we weren't carrying a heavy load mentally right well and that's why you would get bizarre ride what were those recording sessions like um us so let's so man they were they were trippy it was like weed weed fields <laughs> <laughs> not, not so much on my part but you know every time i you know every time 